talking to one of the professors about it. It's on my Hey, David, how you doing? That's Patrick. Doing good, yourself? I can't guarantee that my yeah, video is going to work, but you know what I look like. I'm unplugging your camera and plugging it back in. <laughs> Can you hear me, David? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I can't hear you. How about you, Patrick? Can I hear you? Uh, uh, can you hear me? I can, I can hear you. Yeah, I can't hear you either, unfortunately. I will put up some chat. Try to keep an eye on it as we're going in case you have questions. Oh, there's my video. And like I am probably lucky because my undergrad didn't have a camera left, but it was very hands off. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and get started? I'll share my screen. And we're going to start out. Review a little bit what we did last time. And probably finish this section. Uh, again, just to repeat myself, which I do a lot. Um, kind of the point of this section is to see how signal transductions involved in inducing different tissues and causing the uh, production of new tissues, which then causes gastrulation and production of three axes of symmetry in chordates and vertebrates. So here we are talking about axes of symmetry, no axis of symmetry, like sponges and things like that. Um, I would say that as if I know anything about besides humans. Sponges are made this way. Um, Here's sea anemone, again, radial symmetry. You've got one axis up the middle, and it's kind of the same all the way around. And then you've got your, um, your chordates and, and uh, vertebrates, which you've got dorsal ventral, anterior, posterior, left and right, in and out of the out of the And where would we be without dogs? So that's kind of the point of this lecture. Where we that dog. Okay, so I want to skip ahead a little bit because we'll talk all about that stuff. The point here of, of the lecture was just to talk about how gastrulation happens. And then we'll talk about why it's happening in terms of, of uh, signals and transcription factors and things like that. I'm just going to close the door because there's a lot of noise coming in here. Okay, so here is the blastula, and you know it's a blastula because you've got a big blastocele here, which is a fluid-filled um, area, and as we'll talk about today, the blastula is separating the ectoderm from the endoderm. So here at this kind of mid-blastula stage, you've got three tissues here. You've got ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. Ectoderm is skin and nerve, endoderm is gut and gut organs, and then mesoderm is like blood, skeletal muscle, and skeleton, things like that, heart, heart, blood. Okay, so what's going to happen here is at a late blastula, early gastro stage, these bottle cells start to form, and these cells of endoderm and mesoderm here are going to crawl inside the blastula. Here are your bottle cells, which are forcing these cells up, and they're going to come down and then up across the inside layer of that ectoderm. Is that like based on like hormonal control or like the bottle cells like actually just like attached and causing the growth to like divert? Uh, well, there are two things. 
two things ways I like to look at it. Well, it's basically cells crawling, and that's they're crawling because they're being hit with FGF and Wnt. Okay, that's causing them to be modal. They're not dividing at this point. There's a way that the cells shut off the division aspect of the FGF signaling. So um, it's called involution. They're coming in like that. But did I ask, ask your answer your question or the question I wanted to answer? Um, no, that was about it. Is that about <laughs> it? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So these cells are crawling, and the, the way I think about it, these cells are crawling, and the bottle cells force them to come in. And they continue continue to crawl up across the top of the ectoderm, and that's going to form your three layers here: ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. It also leaves a space between endodermal cells that is the archenteron that becomes the gut. The blastocele is being pushed out. It will be lost eventually. And also we've got epiboly going on, which is ect uh, ectodermal cells are dividing really, really quickly. So you're getting a lot of small cells and they're spreading over the whole embryo on the outside. Okay, so now you've got ectoderm on the outside, so you've got skin on the outside of your body. You've got a hollow uh, archenteron here that will lead to the anus and eventually will make a mouth for that. And the blastocele just gets lost. And we we're talking for a class. I don't know exactly whether this gets pushed out the blastopore or if it just, I think just the fluid gets pumped out and then this collapses and it goes away. The blastocele does disappear. Okay, so that's your gastrulation. And the result of gastrulation is you've got your three tissues all lined up here. And that will allow, um, you know, the three axes to be, to be formed. Um, video. Okay, and the last thing we talked about, I was thinking about this this morning, I was looking at it again, it's kind of like pitching and catching. So to induce, hormones induce, so they're like a pitcher and cells differentiate, they're the catcher. So induce means when a hormone activates new transcription factors, makes new proteins, and that changes the cell type. Um, differentiate is the cell. So the cell is receiving the, that thing, turning into a different type of, of cell and becoming more adult. And again, a, a adultness just means what proteins are being made. So it's going from a more embryonic type cell to a more adult cell. And we talked about pathways of differentiation, how where a cell ends up, what it terminally differentiates at is based on all the hormonal interactions that happened before. Um, at this nexus, if it goes this way, then it can only become these two types of cells. If it goes this way, it can only become these two types of cells. It can't get over that hill and become this again. So the cell then differentiates into what the hormone tells it, but also its ability to receive that hormone and differentiate depends on what hormones it's seen previously. So it's really a history of hormonal interactions causing the differentiation. And I, oh, question. Uh, in terms of like the cancer hasn't happened yet, but in terms of cancer, it's like going over that hill. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, really kind of. Back. Yeah. So, so the question is, what happens with cancer? When I talked about <clears throat> last time, de-differentiation. De-differentiation. Basically, they're coming back up the hill and going backwards. You know. So now they're going to be cells that are dividing, 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 and not forming and doing any function. You know. Um, also, the, another way to look at it is, it gets to this differentiation point and it stops. It no longer differentiates. It just divides. So that's common in leukemias, um, where when you look at someone's blood, they're filled with embryonic cells because the, the bone marrow gets filled with them and they escape into the blood system and they're just, they haven't differentiated further. So less de-differentiation going backwards than never really differentiating. Okay, so now we're gonna get into today. Um, so basically, at this early blastula stage, you've got two tissues, ectoderm and endoderm. And we need that middle one, mesoderm, to make a complete embryo. So this area between the ectoderm and endoderm, we're gonna call marginal zone. And this is where the mesoderm will show up. And our first induction then 
involves endodermal cells turning epidermal cells into mesodermal cells. So these are inducing, these are differentiating. And that's gonna do three things for the embryo. Number one, you're getting your third tissue, mesoderm. So that's gonna give us muscle, bone, and blood. Um, so that's, that's gonna complete the embryo. Also, it's setting up, setting up a second axis because uh, you'll have a dorsal side and a ventral side after this. And then it causes the initiation of gastrulation. And then you end up with the three axis. So this early mesoderm induction is really important for, for, the, um, for the development of the, of the embryo. So here we are, late blastula. You've got ectoderm. And the whole middle part is mesoderm and then endoderm. Okay. How does this happen? So to a certain extent, I'm going to start out talking about it historically, how people figure these things out. And we're talking early 20th century. So obviously no molecular tools. We're not looking at proteins or genes. We're just taking these embryos, taking them apart, and then seeing what happens. So here we are a two cell stage embryo. So it's just divided once longitudinally. These are your polar bodies. Um, so they're not important here. So we take this two stage, em two cell embryo and cut it in half and we find out that each of them will develop into a complete embryo. So at this point, you can, you can make um, clones basically of each other. And we don't know what, I haven't talked about why yet, but it's because this cleavage, this first cleavage goes through this area that's going to be really important to us. So anyway, at this two cell stage, these two cells are, are identical and they're totipotent. They can become anything in the embryo. Now, if we take it to the next step, after the second cleavage, we've got four cells, separate these and they're no longer totipotent. Now they're pluripotent. Um, so these two cells back here, will end up being ventral. So they'll have no dorsal structures, no anterior structures, no axis, just, just ventral tissue. The front ones will become dorsal tissue, but because they're dorsal, which will make more sense later, they end up gastrulating and having axes. So when you let these things grow, you end up with a ventralized embryo, which is nothing but a blob of tissue and a dorsalized embryo, which has got three axes, but doesn't have any gut. So it's got no ventral tissue, it's only got dorsal tissue. So that's what happens when you divide at the fourth four cell stage. And again, obviously it has something to do with this. This is, there's gotta be something dorsalizing right here between this, these two cells of this half, because both of these end up with uh, dorsal tissue and, ax, uh, and axes, and this doesn't. So what's going on here? So our next question. question. You're talking about mitosis at this point, like after this cell has been fertilized or? Yes, this is mitosis. But How come, why after the, it becomes four cells, can it become anything? What, what, what about it? Right, so the question is, why is it at the four cell stage when separated, it's now pluripotent and not totipotent? Right? Why can't it become anything? And that has to do with what we want to talk about now, which is these factors right here. And these factors are going to be um, maternally laid down, right? So it's, it's inherent in the egg. And then uh, and where the sperm hits the egg will determine where that dorsalizing thing works. So we'll get to that today. That's what we're going through today. If we add dorsalizing factors on the other side, mm -hmm. will it have the same effect? Yes. Yes, you'll see in the next set of experiments, if we just cut this tissue out, put it on the dorsal side, it'll create dorsal tissue and another axis over there. Good, good question, actually, both of them, because that's exactly where we're going today. <laughs> so let's look at that. Let's look at that experiment. So, uh, oh, wait, there's another experiment before we do that. No, let's, let's skip that experiment. We'll come back to it. So as long as you guys are asking. So. What happens if you take this dorsal tissue out and stick it into another embryo on the ventral side? Well, that dorsal tissue is going to cause an axis to form. So now we get two axes. And this is called twinning, where you've got twin embryos here. 
Um, and so this cell here, this is very early. This is early blastula, 32 cell stage, is, is going to be the new coop center. So keep that name in mind because we're going to come back to it. Um, and then you can also take a later stage embryo. Here's early gastrula. We're going to take a chunk out above the blastopore lip. So that last cell would have been down here. Um, of course, this is a much later embryo, but that tissue was here. Now we're taking above that tissue. We're going to put it on the ventral side of another gastrula, and we get another twinning happening. Uh, and these are actually more advanced twins than, than these are. Um, but let me just back up, talk about one more experiment. Actually, I don't know if we need to talk about this. Well, I guess we should. Um, another ex early experiment people did to determine um, what's going on here. What the, the hypothesis here is some, something's being released from the endoderm that's turning ectoderm into mesoderm. So how do we test that? Um, we're gonna remove the ectoderm from a blastula and then dissect away any mesoderm that happens to be there, uh, put the ectodermal cap right on top of the endoderm, and then the endoderm ends up turning that ectoderm into mesoderm. So we're changing the cell fate and, and we're only getting ventral and lateral mesoderm. So that'll make more sense later. But here's the experiment. Basically, you cut the animal cap off, take it out, and you make sure it's nice and clean so you didn't take any mesoderm with you. And then you put that ectoderm on top of the endoderm, and some factors from the endoderm are going to turn that ectoderm all into mesoderm. And it's going to be a lateral and ventral mesoderm, not dorsal mesoderm. Okay, so that's just another um, induction experiment. So, and then this is the experiment I'm talking about in this early blastula. We're going to take a chunk out of here, put it over there, and we get two axes. So there's something going on here is what we're learning from this experiment. Something, there are some uh, factors here, proteins, genes, something going on here that's causing this axis to form. So that's where we want to focus. Let's watch this video, this is kind of cool. can't hear it for some reason. You can watch it anyway. And transplanted to another embryo can control the behavior of neighboring cells and direct the formation of an entire body axis. The key experiment is reenacted here by a modern developmental biologist using the frog Xenopus labus. Two Xenopus embryos are maneuvered under the dissecting microscope. The embryos are beginning to gastrulate. So just to give you an idea, the scalpel here, you basically take an eyelash and you put it on the end of a stick with some wax and that's your scalpel. That's how fine this surgery is. The blastopore, where cells are tucking into the interior, is visible as a dark crescent in the embryo on the left. The dorsal lip of the blastopore contains the organizer cells. With a pair of forceps and a fine tungsten needle, a block of organizer tissue is cut from the embryo on the left. Using a hair plucked from a human eyebrow, the block of tissue is gently pushed into a site on the ventral side of the other embryo. An hour later, the graft has healed into the host embryo and the organizer cells have been integrated at an ectopic site. Two days later, the host embryo has developed into conjoined twins. The grafted organizer has caused the host cells around the graft to form a second body axis, complete with central nervous system, eyes, somites, and other structures. Two days later, the host embryo has developed into conjoined twins. I don't know if you can hear that, but really high and weak you can hear Kill me, kill me. The grafted organizer has caused the host cells around the graft 
to form a second body axis, complete with central nervous system, eyes, somites, and other structures. Okay, so point being, there's something here that is capable of giving you that whole axis and, and it's going to cause that development. So let's look at that question. I have two questions. Okay. The first one, is both of those organisms alive because one seemed kind of floppy, so. Jeez, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. So the question, I'm, I have to, my microphone's here. Question was, are they both alive? Yeah, I don't know. Imagine, well, the cells are alive, but are they conscious or are tadpoles conscious? I don't know. So my other question was like, what are the organs that are shared between them? Yeah, I guess all the ventral stuff would be. I, yeah, I don't know. Um, looks like they're connected by the gut. So, uh, well, I don't think they're going to develop very far. You're not going to get a two-headed frog. It's probably just going to die eventually. Yeah, one, because once it one one dead there. Yeah, once it relies on its gut for nutrition, it's going to be all messed up. I would assume. Yeah. I've not gone that far though. Okay, so. Let's see why this is happening. So here we are, we're back at the egg cell. So this is our egg cell, and we've got maternally deposited factors on the bottom and top. And that's gonna make the top animal and the bottom vegetable. So what we have down here in the bottom is BG1, which is a uh, TGF beta-like growth factor. Um, VEGT, which is a transcription factor. Beta-catenin, transcription factor. Wnt which is a growth factor, and the Chevrolet, which is a signal transduction molecule. So what you should know about all of these things, one thing, keep in mind, which ones are growth factors? Because they're, they're going to be secreted and diffused away. Um, transcription factors are going to be, you know, internal, change gene transcription. Um, and uh, so I, I, I mention every time I talk about one, what it is, because then you know whether it's got only affects on the cells it's in or it has cells that it's, it's nearby. Um, and another thing to watch here is uh, one thing is veg T. So this bottom, these bottom cells are going to be uh, vegetal cells, vegetal whole cells, because they've got veg T transcription factor in there. That's going to turn on all the genes that are necessary to make the cell what it is. Um, and then here, if you look at beta catenin, went to disheveled, the these are all related, right? Uh, Wnt uh, binds to disheveled, uh, uh, no, no, binds to frizzle and LRP, and they bring up disheveled, and that turns off GSK3 beta. When you turn off GSK3 beta, you get beta catenin. So basically, what I'm saying is all of these three, and we'll see a, a uh, fourth protein in a moment are increasing data. Stop. Whoop. Stop. Oh, right. sorry, Dr. Slish. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 My four children oh, are <laughs> barking. Sorry. I thought it was on mute. I'm sorry. Oh, it's hard. Come on, man. We got to let dogs be dogs. Okay. All right. So, bottom line. All this stuff is going to increase beta catenin. So keep an eye on beta catenin. That's the key here. Uh, okay, so how do we get it over here? Because this is where our dorsal lip was. This is where all that activity was. So what happens is the cortex, these things are all attached to the cortex of the cell. We usually think of the cortex as being, you know, right here underneath the plasma membrane, which it is and attached to transmembrane proteins and stuck there. But in this early embryo, this cortex can move. So what happens is when the sperm enters, the cortex rotates. So it's gonna rotate away from where the sperm entered. So wherever the sperm enters, and it can enter anywhere in the animal pole in 360 degrees, wherever it hits, the cortex then is going to rotate away from that spot and that puts all these dorsalizing factors kind of at an angle. I forget exactly the angle. It's like 30 degrees, I think, or something from, from where they started at. So that's the first thing that's going to happen. And that's why this is still a one-cell embryo. And this is why way back when we were talking about 
uh, separating these things, right? I said, there's this area, keep an eye on it. This is why that area is important because these dorsalizing factors that were on the bottom now come up to that spot. Does it have the ability to move wherever it needs to? So like if the sperm does, like what if it hits directly on dorsalizing factors, will it just do a full 180 or? Well, if it, it can't, the sperm can't penetrate anywhere down here. Okay. Hey, that's vegetal cells. It'll only penetrate in the animal side. Okay. Do they do like the outer layer move itself, or is it like it changes the other cell eventually, like moving forward? Like there, this is just one cell. Okay. So it's just one cell, and the inside of the cell is rotating. So the plasma membrane is, is still, and the oh. inside is rotating. Oh, okay. So rather than outside rotating, it's the inside that rotates. Right. Right. And it's kind of neat too when you're doing this experiment. Basically, you take the eggs, you dump sperm on them, and when you get the eggs, they're kind of like upside down, right side up. They're all, all different angles, and when they get fertilized, they all rotate with the with the, with the, uh, the externally rotate, so that the animal pole is up and the vegetable pole is down. So you're looking at your dish of embryos. You're seeing yellow and brown all over the place, and eventually, it's all brown on top. There's something about this. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about here, but something about this rotation causes them all to change their buoyancy so that they, they're now that way. But anyway, what we're talking about here is dorsalizing factors, sperm enters the animal pole, and the cortex rotates and brings them up at an angle over here. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Again, Wint, Beta Catman, uh, disheveled. These are the three that we talked about already. They all increase beta catenin. And the third one's GSK3 binding protein. So this is just another protein that's going to inhibit GSK3 beta and increase beta catenin. So what we're doing is accumulating beta catenin in this area here. Okay, so and just kind of reviewing these signal transduction pathways. Here's your wind pathways, frizzled disheveled LRP. And here's the destruction complex breaking down beta catenin. And then when Wnt is around, forms this complex, which inhibits GSK3 beta and beta catenin is allowed to build up. The other signal transduction pathway that's gonna be really important here when we're inducing mesoderm is the TGF beta like signal. So, kind of reviewing this, the TGF beta like signaling, you've got two types of receptors the type one and the type two. Type one will bind the hormone, type two will bind the type one when the hormone's around. So, your hormone shows up, TGF beta, they form a complex, activates the serine threonine kinases in the, in the cytoplasmic domain. And then you phosphorylate the receptor SMAD. And the receptor SMAD, once it's phosphorylated, binds to SMAD4 and enters the nucleus. Okay, pretty simple pathway. Here's what's key about this. Here we're just calling this receptor SMADs. There are a series of different receptor SMADs that can be activated. And then here's SMAD4, and SMAD4 is always the cellular SMAD. So we've got receptor SMADs and cellular SMADs. And there's only one cellular SMAD that's four. All right, why is that important? I'm glad you asked. I believe I talked about this. Yes, slide 26 of chapter nine. How there are two different sets of receptor SMADs that can be activated. So um, backing up a tad, when we are inducing mesoderm, it's going to be induced by these two hormones, the MP4, and these three zenith nodal related. So um, BMP4 is bone morphogenic protein. Um, and nodal is a hormone that's used a lot. I think it was discovered in Drosophila. Um, it's also in chick and it's in mouse. Um, early embryo development, really important. Here, it's just because it's in Xenobus, we're gonna call it the Xenobus nodal-like protein, basically. So Xenobus nodal related. And you've got, we've got four different XNRs. Um, three of them are gonna be involved here. We'll see that third one later. So XNRs one, two, and four 
are then going to activate um, another TGF beta receptor, so TGF beta like receptor. So we've got two different receptors here, one for BMP4 and one for XNRs. The BMP4 one is only going to use receptor SMADs 1, 5, and 8. Okay, and so the XNRs are going to use SMADs 2 and 3. So this is then tells you that you're going to get a slightly different response with BMP4 and with XNRs because those are going to activate different target genes. Here with SMADs 1, 5, and 8, we're going to get ventral mesoderm, okay, which is bone, cart cartilage, um, stuff like that. And with SMADs 2 and 3, SMAD4 will induce dorsal mesoderm, and um, we'll just stick with dorsal mesoderm there. Okay, so quick review. We've got two different hormones that are going to be released from endoderm, BMP4 and XNRs 1, 2, and 4, and they are going to induce mesoderm, BMP4 being more ventral, XNRs more dorsal. Ectodermin is going to come into play here too. So ectodermin is how the cell uh, or how the early embryo is going to make sure that uh, the mesoderm stays where it is. It's not you're not going to end up with an endoderm, uh, uh, an embryo that has no ectoderm because it's all converted to uh, mesoderm. It's going to block the movement of, of this signaling. And it does that by blocking SMAD4. So remember, SMAD4, oops, shoot. SMAD4 is necessary for both of them. So ectodermin then is going to be in the uh, animal pole. It's going to be released and it's going to block um, the, the progression of mesoderm. And we'll see that here. Okay, so here we are in early mesoderm. Remember, VEGT is the transcription factor that is making this endoderm. And because it's endoderm, it's going to release these nodules. And the nodules are going to turn the ectoderm they run into into mesoderm. And that Induction there is going to be limited by ectodermin. Ectodermin is being released from the animal pole and is coming down this way and it's going to block the spread of mesoderm. Um, by the way, the kind of the analog of VEGT is FOX11E. FOX11E is the transcription factor that makes these cells ectoderm, or one of them anyway. And FOX11E is going to cause the production or release of ectoderm, which is a, I guess you could call it a hormone. Well, not really. It's, it's going to be in, intracellular. But anyway, it's going to be blocking SMAD4, which then blocks all the um, XNRs and BMP4 activity. So VEGT releasing nodal. Nodal is a hormone that diffuses up. It converts ectoderm into endoderm in the, in the um, marginal zone, and its movement is being blocked by um, ectodermin. And also the blastopore here, or blastocele here, is blocking the movement of, that, of those um, uh, hormones as well. Yep. Is the, uh, is the only the ectoderm layer, ectoderm layer is turned into mesoderm, or like half and half of both? Uh... It's only only some of the ectoderm. It, it's only ectoderm converting to mesoderm. Okay. I believe. I'm pretty sure. I, y yes, yes. The endoderm is not changing. Endoderm is inducing and the ectoderm is being induced. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so here's just another way of looking at it, a little simpler drawing. You've got veg T down here, which is making this endoderm. Because you've got veg T, VEGT is going to cause the production and release of XNRs 1, 2, and 4, and BMP4. So these are growth factors then released by the endoderm, diffusing through the ectoderm, causing it to become mesoderm. So this whole area now is going to become ventral mesoderm. Okay, so that's our mesoderm induction. And you know this is mesoderm because the transcription factor Urey comes up. Brachyurea is kind of a marker for mesoderm. It, it's a transcription factor that will activate genes that make these mesoderm. Okay. 
and then it's not until the mesoderms forms that we see uh, uh, ectodermin, because that's what's inhibiting uh, ectoderm from becoming mesoderm. Right. So that ectodermin is, is is working its magic right here at this. Right. Just trying to keep the balance of not letting mesoderm overcome, but allowing there to be some change from ectoderm to mesoderm. Exactly, exactly. It's blocking the, the spread of this activity. Yep. Okay, so now we've got ventral mesoderm, but we still haven't finished because we need to get dorsal and ventral. We need to get dorsal involved too. So here again are those factors that were diffused up, or I mean, that rotated up from the sperm entry. And that is going to increase beta catenin again. So the next thing that happens is because you've got a lot of beta catenin here, beta catenin turns on the gene SAMWA. SAMWA is another transcription factor. And SAMWA is going to cause a tremendous increase in XNRs in this part, XNR 1, 2, and 4. So you've got these cells here now are going to be the new coop center. And the, the new coop center, because we've got SAMWA coming up, and they're going to release high concentrations of XNRs into these, this, this mesoderm that's right above it. This ventral mesoderm then becomes the spemin organizer because the high concentration of XNRs induce the production of goosecoid, which is a transcription factor. And goosecoid turns these cells into spemin organizer. And now the organizer is going to release four factors, cordin, noggin, polystatin, and our third XNR, XNR3. And I'm gonna go through this quick, but I'll cover it four more times before I'm done. These are gonna be released from that spemin organizer and diffuse away, and they're going to inhibit BMP4. So dorsalizing, if we go way back real quick, you'll notice here, BMP4 is giving its ventral mesoderm, and XNRs are giving its dorsal mesoderm. So here, we tremendously increase XNRs, and that makes us dorsal at this, at this point over here. And this dorsal part is then going to give us these three things that are going to diffuse away, and give us a gradient of BMP4 activity. And that will give us our... Um, our dorsal ventral axis. So let's see how that works. I know I went through that fast. It doesn't make sense in my mind until you actually see it in the embryo. So let's watch this. Okay, watch me do this. <laughs> I get so excited about this. I, I sound like an idiot over here. Okay, so again, XNRs 1, 2, and 4, and BMP4 are making ventral mesoderm here. At the same time, you've got uh, beta-catenin increasing SAMWA over here. And SAMWA then causes an increase in XNRs. So you've got XNR 1, 2, and 4 all the way through, but here you've got a ton of it. And that then is going to induce goosecoid in these cells. So these cells now are the spemin organizer. And the spemin organizer then is going to make cordin, noggin, polystatin, and XNR3. And they're going to diffuse from this point in this direction. And remember, this is a hollow ball, so it's going around the cell, around the, the embryo from this point all the way around. So what's going to happen now? These, these four things, what they do is block BMP signal. So over here at this end, where, where, the, the four, where all four of them are at the highest concentration, this is going to be dorsal. And then as you get further away from that spemin organizer, you're getting more and more BMP4 activity. And that gradient of BMP4 activity, then it's going to give you that dorsal ventral axis. So over here, where you've got high BMP4 activity, um, it's going to be ventral mesoderm. So that's like, you know, your belly <laughs> over here, okay? That doesn't make sense. Forget I said that. I don't know. Ventral mesoderm, anyway. And over here, there's no BMP4 activity, so it's dorsal mesoderm. And then everything from here to here becomes somewhere between dorsal and ventral. It totally sets that axis up. And here's the cord in itself kind of exacerbates this uh, 
um, gradient activity because cardin will pick up uh, BMP. So green is BMP, red is cardin. So cardin picks up BMP, diffuses this way with it. And when it gets over here, there's a, there's a, a kinase that breaks cardin down and releases BMP over here. So it's like a, um, a, uh, a moving walkway. Corbin's constantly bringing it back here and releasing it, and it's trying to diffuse in this direction. But we've got a, a gradient here then of high XNR activity to high BMP4 activity. And that's what gives us our, our dorsal ventral gradient. And also, because this is really dorsal, that's going to cause it to become the lead edge of the gastrulation that will give us the the um, anterior posterior axis as well. So here, here, damn it, I keep saying that. I'm sorry. Um, here, mid blastula, you've got veg T and, and VG1, which is making this endoderm. But over here, you've got high beta catenin. So beta catenin with uh, veg1. Oh, I'm sorry. Veg1 and veg T are going to give you low XNR activity. But you add beta catenin in and you get high XNR activity. So, where you don't have beta catenin, you get ventral mesoderm. Where you have high activity, you get the nucoop center. So, over here, high XNR, nucoop center releases um, high XNRs, induction of goose coid here. So, here's your pregastula here, just about to start, really high um, uh, goose coid turned on here. And goose koi then releases cordon, noggin, and volostatin that diffuse in this direction, giving us that gradient of BMP4 activity. Here's another way of looking at it. I've got like four different models that all say the same thing in different ways. Sometimes I think seeing it in different figures and how other people think of it help you uh, to understand it better. So here's another way of looking at it. Here is your spemen organizer releasing cord and noggin XNR3, and it's moving in this direction, blocking BMP4, which is now kind of high here and low here, so you've got a gradient going in that direction. Also, these four are blocking uh, the movement of BMP4 through the vegetal cells, so this is going to be dorsal in the derm. And then, you know, so that's like gonna be the top of the archenteron, the top of the gut there. So these cells are going to be crawling in during gastrulation. And then if you go up, we also see effects here where we're blocking BMP4, which is making um, ectodermal cells become neuroectoderm instead of epidermal ectoderm, which when you think about the vertebrate, the dorsal side is where, where most of the neural, neural structures are, right? Brain and spinal cord. So here, BMP4 ventralizing again, and these things dorsalizing. So here, we're, we're going to, as this thing crawls through, then you're going to end up with dorsal mesoderm coming forward, making anterior and across the top, and then bringing that dorsal endoderm with it for the top of the archenteron. Here we are again. We didn't talk about FGF. FGF is part of this as well. Um, FGF, I believe, is posteriorizing, um, I forget now, but it could be. <laughs> okay, so again, cordon noggin, all statin blocking BMP and making this neuroectoderm, making this uh, dorsal endoderm, your blastopora lip is here and gastrulation will start there. Question? So it seems like the cordon, noggin, postatin are not completely able to stop BMP4 activity, like when it's coming from that way. Right. What allows it to stop it when it's in the epidermal ectoderm so right. that it like completely stops Well, it. it's not really going to stop. Let me do one more thing, and then I'll answer that based on the last thing I was going to talk about today, okay? So here's, here's what's going on. So... As those three are diffusing away, they are, you know, high in concentration at the spemen organizer. And, you know, just like any diffusion thing, there's going to be 
less and less concentrated as you get further and further away, okay? So that gives you a gradient then of BMP4, not striped, not like stipe, uh, uh, bright lines between one and the other, but a, a continuous gradient from one end to the other. So how do we get serious stripes out of something that's a continuous gradient? Well, that's one of these beautiful things that happens in early embryo development in that a gradient can cause different genes to be turned on at different concentrations. So here, this is an experiment where they take um, beads and they coat them with activin. Now, activin is a, um, is a TGF beta-like um, hormone that's also present here in this early embryo. And it does the same thing XNRs do, it's dorsalizing. So they take this dorsalizing um, uh, hormone, they soak beads in it, and they put it on top of an animal cap. Now, at a low concentration of activin, it doesn't go very far, right? It's diffusing away. It only gets a little bit away from there. And you get low response genes, brachiuri, which is um, mesoderm, okay? And then if you put a high concentration, it diffuses away and close to the beads where activin's highest, you're getting goose koi, which is spoon organizer, that's dorsal, right? Versus this yellow, which is kind of middle mesoderm, brachiuri. But what's interesting about this experiment is that when you look at it, you get a sharp demarcation between goose koi expression and brachiuri expression and no expression of any mesodermal markers. So this gradient, although it's continuous, is giving us specific markers between one thing and another, okay? And it has to do with, you know, the level of gene activation is gonna turn on a certain set of genes. You turn on more of that, you get different genes being activated, if that makes sense. So anyway, that's what's going on here. We're producing a, a continuous gradient of BMP, but that continuous gradient is giving us dorsal, middle, and ventral tissues. Oh, here's just another way of looking at it. Vegetal making mesoderm, organizer tissue here, a locking ventral. So you end up with ventral mesoderm, middle mesoderm, and dorsal mesoderm. And we already talked about this one. Is this up here? Yeah, I don't know why it's here. This slide don't, doesn't need to be here. Okay, so that's it. That's all I got for this for this lecture. Um, so again, the reason I'm doing this is showing how uh, signaling through different pathways causes induction of different tissues um, by which transcription factors get turned on. Is that good? All right, let's stop or stop sharing. I've been oversharing. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> it's okay, Brittany. <laughs> Brittany, are you in Burlington? Because I want to meet those dogs. Oh, well, she's not on you. Okay. Anyway, uh, any questions about today? That's about all I want to do. Um, so this is going to be the end of material for the next exam. As I said in the announcement, I haven't heard any, anyone uh, complaining about it. Um, so we're going to have our exam next Thursday. I'll put a quiz together today for you guys, and um, that will be up tomorrow morning. So you'll have a quiz on this material. And then next Tuesday, we'll review the whole, the whole schmear and then Thursday exam. And then the following week, which will be our last week of classes, I'm going to do MCAT prep, prep on Monday and Wednesday. Um, so that's, that's the plan at this point, if everyone's okay with that. Okay, are we good? Shall we call it a day? Patrick, we can't stop until you say we're, we're ready to stop. You're in charge here. He's ignoring me. Patrick's ignoring me. You just lost three bonus points, Patrick. <laughs> oh, here he is. We're good. Okay, good. 
Okay, um, I'm going to shut this off now if I can figure out how, and I'll see you again on Monday. How do I stop this? How do I stop this? And the little red square with the drawn note.